Amen in everything. Can somebody say amen? Somebody say praise the Lord. Hallelujah in everything. Hallelujah. Can you say preacher, preach to me? Are you serious? No. Amen. Praise the Lord. Why don't you once again shake three or four hands and say, I hope he preaches to me today. the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. Amen. And uh, praise the Lord. I do want to say thank you to all of those that did a good deed the other day. And thank you for your, your effort, your love offering of your time and what you had done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Praise the day. Praise the day. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. My mind is all over the place. And, uh, you know, I believe today is going to, I'll put it this way, it's going to be a teaching day today, and uh, hallelujah. So, uh, bear with me, we're going to break into this and get into it, and uh, hallelujah, God be the glory, amen. Somebody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Some years ago, a few years ago, I had gone in and uh, had surgery, and when I had gone in surgery, amen, um, I was given this box right here, amen, the individual knows who gave it, okay, and um, I'm probably going to leave it on the platform, but it says, every strike brings me closer to the next home run, every strike brings me closer to the next home run, and that saying was done by Babe Ruth some years ago, and uh, uh, I had mentioned to the church before uh, because I didn't want there to be any understanding, but uh, I've had looks on people's faces when, when I make different comments, and I think it's important that people know where you're coming from, but uh, people will come up from time to time. If you don't know, at least you'll know today, but uh, people will come up from time to time and say, hey, you know, Brother Mascroft, how you doing? And I'll tell them, I'm swinging. Amen. I'm swinging. And we are going somewhere, so just give me some time. And uh, whenever I say that, let me just kind of better say give, give you the truth. I'm not a swinger back out of my gen generation that I came out of because there were such things as swingers, okay, and they were dancers is what they were. Um, but I will say that uh, there was a time before, and I had mentioned this to people, that uh, back before my time, just a little bit, was a guy by the name of Babe Ruth. And um, Babe Ruth was notorious for home runs as well as strikeouts. More, he was pretty popular. A reporter had came to him one day and, and asked and said, hey, look, Babe Ruth, what would you contribute to your success? He said, you know, just keep on swinging. You'll hit something. Amen. So today I'm going to try to hit something. <laughs> I'm going to try to hit something. Amen. Amen. So allow me to build somewhat and give me just a little bit of time, and we will get to where we're going to get to, and uh, praise the Lord. This last week, we were on outreach, and uh, when I say outreach, I believe that our lives should be a life of outreach. It isn't just coming on a Saturday morning, or like this next week, we're going to have outreach on a Wednesday evening, uh, due to people understand on the weekends being gone a whole lot, but um, what I'm saying, I'm losing my thought, but it will come to me. My mind this last week has been from here to there, and it's going to somewhere get in the middle, so bear with me, okay? Hallelujah. Amen. But this last week on outreach, you say, well, what's outreach? Well, we had a, on Tuesday, we had came together, and we had a good time. Uh, we had a church picnic, and uh, I will say this is how I view it. Uh, some people view it as a picnic for themselves. But I view it as an outreach. 
And uh, myself, there are times that I will deny myself of going certain places. And the reason why I will deny it is because I feel that some things are important, more important, and I can always do what I want to do at another time. But uh, this Tuesday, we were uh, at the picnic, my wife and I, and began to carry a very interesting conversation. And uh, I had a question that had kind of hit me just right between the eyes. I honestly did not know how to answer it. And I believe the best thing when it comes to those things, just say, well, I don't know. It's something I'm going to have to think about. You know, people at times always think that, you know, an answer is demanded. You know, if you don't know, you just say, I don't know. Maybe I can get back with you later and we can just take it at a later date. But the question was thrown at me by this individual, uh, which I will say has been coming and visiting this church. And uh, I will say this, keep praying for this family. You say, what family is it? Amen. I'd say, just keep on praying for them. (laughs) Okay. Keep on praying for them. Amen. Because God is doing a great work, a good work in the background. And um, he asked me a question. We'd probably talked for about an hour and a half. And he asked me a question. And that question was, what would you consider, what would, what would you say, Reverend, in your ministry that has been the hardest thing for you? And he began to, to mention a couple of things. I'm not going to mention those things, but he had brought the comment along. And that comment was, Pastor, what is the hardest thing that you ever had to deal with in your ministry? I began to think, and I'll be honest with you, at that time, I could not come up with an answer. Uh, I, I was blank. You ever been on the spot before where someone asked you a question, you're just blank? You don't know what to ask. And uh, I looked at my wife that was sitting next to me, and I said, "Hun, what's the hardest thing that I've ever had? I'm not talking about, I understand, dealing with in the ministry. And she was somewhat puzzled because, you know, when you look over 30-some years, or maybe 30-some years, I'd say 24 and 13, 36, 37 years in the ministry, uh, I'll say this, you run across a lot of things. And uh, sometimes there are things that are tough, they're hard, maybe at that time. But my mind began to ponder, and the thought began to hit me um, as of yesterday. And that thought was, the toughest thing as a pastor, and, and understand this, and please don't take me wrong, man, I will say right now, I just want to set, the, set it straight, but I'm talking to all of us today. I'm not talking about one or two, but I'm talking about everyone that's here today because I believe that we can definitely benefit from what I'm going to bring forth. But the hardest thing in the ministry that I have, as a pastor, have ever had to deal with is the self-will of an individual. Understand, you can say, well, was adultery harder to deal with? No, it wasn't. I must be honest with you. Because there are people that actually can that do commit sin and uh, understand, and by the grace and by the blood of Jesus Christ, they are forgiven. Thank God for it, because I'm glad that, that God is a God of grace and forgiveness. Uh, it's very important, because people need a hope, and they need a way, uh, some refuge they can turn to, and that is Jesus Christ. But that is not the hardest thing. And and I thought on that for a moment. I said, you know, it's easy to deal with somebody that can see their own sin. It's easy to deal with someone that, a friend that know they've committed sin and know that they're wrong before God. And you talk about a repentant person that comes across. Friend, that's not the hardest thing to deal with because they've already come to a place within their lives that they understand, you know, I've done wrong before God and how important that is. But in the time that I have been within ministry and began to, to ponder, began to think about some things, and that thought had came to me, as a pastor, the hardest thing I've ever had to put up with or had to deal with, amen, is the self-will of an individual, amen. I do want to make a statement, and if I could label it today or title it today, I would put it this way. Your self-will, understand, is going to reveal the level of your submission. Understand. And I want that to sink in. And I'll say this. I'm not looking for a shouting and running service. I believe there's times and there's places for all of this. 
But I believe that when it comes to a church, that a church will not mature, a church will not grow, friend, unless there are teachings that are brought, brought across that need to be for that assembly and that congregation. Amen. Many times evangelists are, are concerned about, well, let's get up and get the hype and let's get the jumping and get the shouting. I will say to you today, friend, if there's anything that's ever helped me in my walk with God, and that's when a good old-fashioned preacher got behind the platform, he began to put the nails in the coffin and tell it just like it was because there were things in my life that needed to die, friend, and I needed to get rid of and friend, please don't take me wrong because we love shouting, we love worshiping, we, we love the things of God, but we better just be honest about some things, friend. If we're going to make it through those doors one day, there's some things that have got to happen within our lives. And if we think that we're going to go through those doors, friend, not dealing with certain things in our life, you are fooled. Understand, you are fooled within yourself. I need the preaching of the word, friend, to help get me through the doors of heaven one day. Amen. And so my mind began to ponder, and, uh, and I hate it when it begins to ponder because then I'm between here, I'm between there, and everywhere else. And uh, so we're going to make the best of what we got today and go from there. But I want to leave you that thought one more time. Your self-will is going to reveal the level of your submission, of your submission. Amen. Amen. We can take different passages within the Word of God, and uh, we can somewhere begin to digest them. And uh, one, one passage I want to bring you to, and we can get into Scripture, but let me just somewhere go the route that I feel like going. But there was a time back in the Old Testament, and it was in the time of Moses, Moses had called, God had called Moses to become the one that was going to help lead the children of Israel, friend, out of Egypt, and yet bring them into another land, which was Canaan. When we begin to look at Moses, he had struggles within his life. Uh, we understand that uh, as the first 40 years, he lived in the palace, friend, of of uh, Pharaoh himself. And I will say this, I believe that somewhere back in history, from what I've researched, that uh, understand there were different pharaohs that were in there. Um, and when it came to the time that but right before, uh, let me put this way, after Moses had been born for about two years, uh, give or take somewhere maybe a little bit less than that, but it had to have been less than that because he was an infant, a babe. But uh, in that time, we realized that Pharaoh himself had made a decree, and that was to go about and to kill all the babies from two years old and under. Well, when we look at this passage, and we look a little bit later on, and the, uh, that Moses himself was in the house of Pharaoh. He grew up. Moses was not an ignorant individual. Uh, he was one that came up underneath the best education there ever was. But there was something later that happened within the life of Moses. And he chose not to go the way of Egypt. But there was a God that was dealing with his heart and pulling upon his heart. And one day he begins to walk by a bush. And the Bible calls it a burning bush. One that was on fire that could not be consumed, friend. Why? Because God was going to go ahead and get the attention of Moses. Moses goes through another 40 years, friend, because understand, he had committed murder. Understand, he had committed murder and killed an Egyptian. So somewhere God himself had to allow uh, time to go by so things would happen that uh, hopefully some things would not be remembered later. At the, approximately the age of maybe somewhere, give or take, 80 years old, and uh, uh, the Lord is beginning to deal with Moses and talking to Moses and say, look, Moses, uh, uh, my people have been crying for over 400 years, and uh, you talk about bondage, you talk about captivity, uh, uh, you talk about the cries coming from the men, the women, and the children, and the torment and everything that is going on. Uh, can I say at that time, when it came to Pharaoh, he was a mean king. He was an ugly king, friend. He was not a godly man. Did you hear what I said? He was not a godly man. And we realize that in that time that uh, of, of Moses, that things are beginning to build and escalate, and, and God begins to bring along the pestilences that begin to happen. And you talk about an ugly time, and it comes to the extreme of, uh, of later, where it comes to the firstborn friend that uh, Pharaoh himself 
uh, is getting to the place that he's going to let them go because even his very son is going to be the one that's going to lose his life. Where are you going, preacher? Give me just a moment. Can I say that within the life of Pharaoh himself, he had a will that was already hard. He had a will that was strong, and you may say today, is there anything wrong with a strong-willed person? No, I I don't believe there's anything wrong with a strong-willed person, but I do believe that if we're not careful, there are lines that we can cross that will somewhere hinder our submission to the Almighty God. Did you hear what I said? I believe there are lines that we as people that's been filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, friend, uh, that we need to understand uh, there are some things I don't want to let happen within my spirit because if it does, it's going to somewhere affect my relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. And we look in this time, and the Bible had made, uh, the Lord had made a statement that he, he hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Well, why would God do that? Number one, I'll put it this way. God was going to show who God was. And God was going to show his glory, friend, that was going to take place just maybe days that were going to be down the road. But why would God set Pharaoh up? You know, we can ask a lot of questions, and we can research, and we can get into different areas. But I'm going to say this. The more when you dig in this thing, and and this is the problem that we have with many people today. You know, they want to leave it to the preacher to do the research and just put it on the table, preacher. I'm going to say this. Many times the preacher will dig it out and put it on the table, and still people are not going to eat what they they need to eat. Come on, why? Because there's a will on the inside. And with the will, many times, there's stubbornness that sets within. And when it does, it hinders the relationship between them and God. But in this time, we understand before, friend, that Pharaoh himself had already been hardened. Well, why, preacher? Because of his self-will. It's what he chose to do and. You know, he's the king, and he's the authoritative figure, and, you know, he's got to kind of keep up his image and, uh, and somewhere maintain what needs to be done. And not only that, but he was fearful in the time because when he came to the children of Israel, they were growing very rapidly. He was afraid that very possibly that they'll get too big maybe, and they might even take over Egypt. Amen. Can I say this? You know, we're never going to understand everything that God does. But, but I'll say this. I'll leave it with God. But we, we look back and uh, we begin to associate the self-will of ourselves. Amen. Uh, well, preacher, nobody in our church like that. My God, you better check the statistics. Amen. Amen. And let, I, want, I want to drive this in just a little bit, okay? Uh, and bel- believe me, I'm all over the place this morning, and that's, that's going to be fine, okay? But when it comes to the will of an individual, it is going to tell how much in their life that they're going to submit to God. Now, let me say right now, what is the opposite of self-will? And when I begin to research this and I begin to look into it, I understand the opposite of self-will is humility. And there is something about people themselves. And uh, uh, can I better say the way they handle themselves, the way they carry themselves, the, uh, the way that they, their mannerisms is and the way that they uh, understand, uh, go about. And I'll say this, you can definitely see I don't know any other better way to put it, but just be straight. You, you'll see attitudes. Okay, and with those attitudes come with different spirits that uh, come along the way. Amen. And, uh, and there is definitely a distinct difference between someone that is not going to submit. Understand, when I talk about submission, let's get that straight and let's understand number one. because And it's just a teaching class today. That, that's good. When I come to church, I am submitting to the Almighty God. Come on, let, let's get that straight. I believe that many times people have got a, a false interpretation 
of submission. Because, friend, this whole thing is built upon God, Jesus Christ himself. Being understand our foundation, which is the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. So I understand as a pastor, I want to be in complete submission to what God is asking me to do. Because how can I lead somebody, understand, if I first can't submit to the authority? Praise the Lord. And uh, when there's authority that is within our life, uh, understand, it's going to show the level of your submission. Praise the Lord. Now, there are people in our day and time that uh, I will say they're not going to submit to authority. And, uh, you know, somewhere you're going to have to deal with a few things because, you know, it's one thing to deal with God. But it's another thing to deal with police. Uh, What do you mean, preacher? Well, I'll say this. If you say you're not going to submit to something, I want to say you're a liar. Because, friend, you're going to be brought under force some way or another. I thank God that God is a gentleman. But I'll say to you, you go out there and rob a bank, and you let the police catch up with you. I'll tell you what, they're going to chase you down. They're going to hunt you, friend, just like dogs, friend. They get a hold of something. They're not going to let go of this thing. And sooner or later, friend, you're going to be, your will is going to be brought underneath another authority. Now, when we come to Jesus Christ, I will say to you today, friend, I'd rather come to Christ in humility. I'd rather come to Christ in brokenness. I don't want to come before Christ with an arrogant and a nasty or a self-willed attitude that, God, I know everything, and, God, it's you that needs me. Do you hear what I'm saying today? If there's anybody that needs God, it's me that needs God. Let me get it straight. It's me that needs God. (laughs) Amen. And uh, when we come to... The level of submission. Can I say number one? It is a beautiful thing. Because it tells a lot about that individual. I'm so glad you're listening today. I really am. And you know, before too long, I'm going to take a few strikes. Oh, it's quieter. Amen. Amen. You know, some things are just needful, okay? But we're laying some groundwork, okay? We're laying some groundwork. You know, I want to put it this way. I have no regrets within my life living for God. I haven't missed out on anything. Uh, Understand. And I believe that a lot of things that that people get misconceptions And uh, if we're not careful, they begin to let pride and arrogance within their spirit begin to happen. And uh, I'll say this, they're different people. Amen. Have you ever noticed a person that is very self-willed? It's all about themselves. Have you ever noticed an attitude that comes along and many times it's stubbornness? None of y'all never seen a stubborn person, have you? You have been so blessed in a special way. Uh, Let me say right now, have you ever seen someone that is arrogant also? I mean, stubborn being also arrogant? You Normally, sooner or later, it's going to lead up to that, okay? And and understand, this affects our level of submission. Amen. You know, many times, uh, the Word of God has given us instruction and the Bible has when it said when it comes to the preacher, preach, teach. Be instant in season as well as out of season. Amen. And I want to use a few areas today, if, if you don't mind. And uh, I'll, I will say that, you know, I thank God for good old-fashioned preachers. I said thank God for good old-fashioned preachers. Amen. Now, I'm not old, but I'm getting there. But I look at the ones that have come and gone before us, and maybe I can just use some analogies. Like I said, I'm all over the place. Maybe I can use some analogies uh, to show you where I'm coming from. Amen. You know, submission is something that I believe this. If you don't have a certain level of submission in your life to God and, and to what the Bible has told us, 
I'll just be blunt with you. You're not going to make it in. Come on. Can I just put it this way? You can't make it to heaven on your own terms. You cannot make it to heaven, friend, by being a good person. Come on. Somewhere you're going to have to get stout within your spirit. Uh, There are things you're going to have to stand up to your family, to situations. And I'll say this, friend, it's going to determine what you become within God. So I just want to get it straight. Living for God ain't going to be easy. But I'd rather be straight and be up front with you, friend. Living for God's going to be the best life you ever had. Because there's going to be a lot of good benefits that's going to come along. I don't care what the world says. I don't care what they tease you about. I just want to get it straight. They haven't learned some things themselves when it comes to God. And don't judge something until you've been involved in it, okay? I remember some years ago when I first came to the church here. And um, there are times that as... Uh, come, I was here for about, I'm gonna, I believe about six weeks, and I was sitting underneath Brother Barkley, and uh, God bless you all, I'll tell you this, that we're underneath the ministry of Brother Barkley. And Brother Barkley had his own way, just like any other preacher has their own ways when it comes uh, to going about doing some things. And thank God that we're not clones. Thank God that we can be our own mans. But I'll say this, sometimes I wish I had the guts that Brother Barkley had. I'll be frank with you. Did you hear what I said? I said, sometimes I wish I had the nerve. And you know, I'm still praying for some things, but God, in that nerve, would you give me some tact? And would you give me some wisdom? Because, my God, I've I seen that man pull things off I've never seen before. And, uh, and I remember one time, and, uh, you know, Brother Barkley was straight, man. Uh, there was no bending in the middle of the road. There was no backing up. And if you wanted a fight, friend, <laughs> uh, come on, I'm talking about a fight in God. I didn't say fist to fist. I'll tell you this. He's going to take the word of God. He's going to back it up. And he's going to tell you just like it is. And a lot of people today won't take it. Did you hear what I said? I said a lot of people won't take it. And friend, I'll say this, if you come out of a church that's mushy and gooey, that ain't been taught nothing, that don't know nothing when it comes to God, I want to say right now, you just as well get your britches on and begin to learn some things and develop some things in God that you need to get underneath your belt. Amen. And uh, I remember just watching him, and he had a little... uh, Sometimes he'd take him right back to the office, a little hole in the wall with no windows, or he'd get you right out in front of everybody. And my Lord, I'll tell you, and he went up to one man one night, and uh, he looked at him, and he said, you know, I want to tell you something. And this brother Bark, he put his finger right in your face. He said, you know, you ain't been paying your tithes or your offerings. Boy, that's pretty bold. Remember Brother Loopy? <laughs> and I, I seen him do it more than one time. Do you know why Brother Barkley did what he did? Because he picked up on the self-will of certain individuals. And Brother Barkley knew that he had to deal with certain men and certain women certain ways, friend. Because somewhere he knew that self-will needed to be broken within their spirit. Is it Brother Barkley's job to break it? No, friend. But it's his word to hold up the authority of the word of God. It's his word to teach and to preach what needs to be done. And as the pastor of a church, he was doing what he felt needed to be done. So he would go up to that individual. And he said, you know, I mean, he wasn't arrogant. But he said, you know, you haven't been paying your tithes and offerings, have you? And if they would have said yes, he would have came back across and said, you're a liar. Well, that's not to coach your pr- pastor. No, the problem is, is today, people in the church want everything patty caked. People want everything nice and smooth. And, and pastor, don't you offend me because if you do, I'll just go down the road and go somewhere else. I, I'll say this, friend, if that offends you and bothers you, uh, you are probably already headed down the road and going to some other place. Uh, but I'll say this, uh, your self-will is going to reveal the level of your submission. I hope you catch on to what I'm saying. Because our will has got to become his will. 
And when Jesus was here by supreme example, he prayed up to, to, to the Father and said, not my will, but thy will be done. And when I can get rotten, stinking will out of the way, I'm telling you right now, friend, we can submit to what God has got. Amen. And, uh, you know, people... Give me time. I'm building. You know, people play games with the preacher. So, you know, to make it look good, that guy pulled his wallet. Understand, the offering had been taken, friend, already. This was after church. Pulled his wallet out and said, you know, Brother Barkley, I got a check here. I meant to put it in. You liar. You were planning. You were contemplating probably what was going to happen because maybe you were dealt that way before. I just forgot to put it in. Well, would you like to give it to me right now? (laughs) I'm not preaching on tithes and offerings. I'm trying to make a point. You see, as a pastor, the hardest thing that I've ever had to deal with or Brother Barkley, or any other pastor throughout the ranks of the apostolic Pentecostal movement, friend, understand is the self-will of an individual. Are they or are they not going to submit, understand, to Christ? And so when we, we begin to look at this, people get an attitude, well, I'm not submitting to you, preacher. I'm not asking you to. I'm asking you to submit to the delegated authority. Can I say this? I'm just the one right now, friend, that's in the office. There's going to be somebody else sooner or later another day that's going to take this office. It's the one that's in the uniform that I'm respecting the office that God has delegated. But when I give it, I'm not giving it to the preacher. I'm giving it to God himself. And whatever God has delegated, I'm going to leave it there. Amen. And... uh... And you know, he took that wallet and pulled that check out. You know, he was guilty. You know, I'll be honest with you when it comes to God. It's better just to be honest. You know, I'll tell you this. It's like a person that goes out and cheats on his wife. You know, I could deal with somebody that's sorry for doing it. And it's not going to do it again. But how do you deal with somebody that's not sorry? You know, it's, it's that wheel that gets in the way. It's, it's kind of just like Pharaoh. Well, huh, I ain't going to let you guys go. There's just no way it's going to happen. Until God brings something along the way, friend, that's going to shake your world and going to rock your boat and bring you to a place that he's going to let you know, friend, I I am God and nobody's going to steal my glory. I'm going to do as I choose. You can either line up or else I'll deal with you the way I've got to deal with you. Now, I'll say this. God was merciful because he didn't destroy Egypt, friend. Uh, Yes, he took quite a few in number. But I'm going to tell you this. He was merciful, and he allowed Egypt to continue on. And some of the problems we got today, friend, is with Egypt. That's, that's happening. But you see, my point is this. When it comes to yourself and your will, you know, it, it shows your spirit of submission. There is nothing more beautiful. You, well, let me just get some. I, I feel some things. Well, preacher, you want me to bow your feet? Hogwash. Get off your childish kick and get your diapers off, friend, and start getting the underwear on you need to get on and get the britches on like you need to get on. Come on. Oh, oh man, you're just a little bit arrogant. Pre- I'm not arrogant. You've got to understand as a pastor what I've gone through. And I'm telling you, friend, I, the toughest thing I'll ever do with is going to be your attitude and your spirit. My God. So, you know, and I'll say this. To this day, that man still has not learned everything. I'm not going to give you the name. 
You know, there's, there's things that happen within life that shows a lot about people. And people that normally drift away from God, you begin to see things that begin to affect their spirit. Can I say this? And I'm just preaching today, and like I said, I'm all over the place. There are those of you that you have been affected, and you're infected. And, well, preacher, how do you know? There's some things that have been preached and taught around this place. That has affected the level of your submission to God. And hiding behind the curtain can come out a false pretense. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Amen. You know, as pastors... And um, I will say this, I've been accused of everything when it comes to being a pastor. And I'm not looking for no poor me attitude or anything like that, okay? But I'm just talking to you because, you know, this is a people's business. If you're new today and it's the first time you've been here, thank you for coming. And uh, praise the Lord, I will say this, just hang on for the ride, okay? Just hang on for the ride. But you're not going to go to a lot of places that they're going to tell it straight and just put it just the way it's supposed to be. You can go right down the road, and I'll tell you this. All they're going to preach on is love, but love don't develop people what needs to be made complete within their life. Come on. I'll say this. The the cross makes a big difference, friend. The blood of Jesus makes a big difference. But I'm going to tell you this. we got to come to a place and understand that sin is sin, and we deal with sin, and sin needs to be taken care of. Amen. You go before a judge. I want you to understand, friend. Uh, Yes, he'll listen to your story, and you can give him all the pitiful story you want to give him. But somewhere, friend, he's going to have to judge the situation. And what is he going to do? He's going to go by the facts and what you did, what happened, friend, and, and understand the way that you understand conducted yourself in such a time now we ourselves when it comes to living for God I will say this our mannerisms our will conducts what is happening within our life as well as our level of submission to God amen and I'm beginning, I'm, I'm thinking of some situations, and I, 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 can I just be blunt and be honest with you today? Um, and uh, there are some people that as a pastor that you will take the hammer and try to drive things home, and all you can do is preach the word and do it. And, and you know what? The choice is going to be up to those people. Amen. Do you love them? You still love them? You still care for them? You still pray for them? But... You know, you just, you, you really truly want to see them make some changes and, and get back to God where they need to get back to. And uh, amen. But it, it's like, you know, you preach faithfulness. Does anybody know what faithfulness means? Being faithful to the house of God. And I know at times there are certain reasons and excuses. Amen. Um, boy. I'll tell you this, I believe heaven's going to have the biggest book of excuses we've ever seen. I mean, there's, there, I'm sure there's some of them I haven't even heard yet. And I hope I never do hear them. But, you know, people, they need to get a concept <coughs> of being faithful to God. In the times that Or when the time comes that I need God the most. I hope when I call on that name of Jesus Christ. That I have been faithful to him. I will use an illustration. I will say this. I am not perfect. I'm not even trying to declare anything like that. I'm human just like all the rest of you are human. But I remember when I had the heart attack this last year in January. And when I had that heart attack, 
you know, I, I can call on the name of Jesus and not have to worry about some things. You know, I don't want to use God because he's God. Because I believe that God works all things out to the good of them that are in Christ Jesus. But I know some people, the only time they call on God is when they're in trouble with God. Or, or in trouble with the law. And, and friend, I'll say this. You know what? You need to first break some things and get that, that stubbornness, that rebellion that's within. Do you hear what I said? I said you need to get rid of that rebellion that needs to go within your life and get those things straightened out within, friend. Because nobody that, that's got a rebellion against the things of God is going to make heaven. Well, can that happen to any saint in the church? Yes, it can, little by little. The Bible talks about the little foxes. Those little foxes, you know, come on, I'm, I'm talking a, a lot to people that's been established in the church for some time. Those little foxes begin to, to nip at the vines. Whoa. Whoa. And you know what happens when you begin to start nipping at this and nipping at that? Your will is being affected by some things. Well, I've been living for God for 20, 30 years. I think I know a little something in this. Yeah, that's the problem. There's no humility that needs to be there. Well, God understands my situation. I'm sure he does. It's good old preaching today. You know, it's good old pre you did ask me to preach to you. <laughs> I said, you did ask me. Okay. And come on. You know, I'm here to do the best I can to get as many to go to heaven that, that, that can get to heaven, friend. But you know what's making the biggest difference is what's in between and, and how you're being affected and what's going on in your life. And is it a struggle for me? Yes, it's a struggle for me. Because I hate to see you the way you are and the way that you're coming across. And, and I know you're wrong. And if I told you you're wrong, you get offended at me. Now, me, Pastor, whenever you see something happen in my life, when I want you to come straight up and you're a liar. Until that situation comes along and, and I put it in your face and I've seen it kick me right back in my, in my face, friend. Preacher, let me know when some. No, you won't take it. Not till I see you can get down to an altar and you can begin to start talking to God and let God do some things in your life. Sometimes you have to do it anyway and get kicked anyway. You see, our self-will has a way of justifying. You know, when it comes to living for God, and um, maybe, maybe I can, uh, I'm, I'm going to use this, praise the Lord. Where's me and at? Is that all right? Okay. I, I called her in the office this morning. And um, I said, Mina. And I was putting her in the place of a, of a pastor. Because I wanted some advice. And uh, I said, Mina. Am I doing all right? Well, yeah. You're, you're living by example. And you're leading. And uh, I said, Mina, you don't live with me 24 hours a day. How do you know? And I didn't plan on doing this. It's just the way it's happening, okay? And I'm not here to embarrass her. We love her, appreciate her. Um, and um, and, and I, beg I said, you know, uh, you know what, well, what can I do to do better? He goes, oh, I don't know. You're doing everything I think you, you need to do. You know, can the preacher look you back in the face and say the same thing? Well, probably not, huh? I've had people come up to me and say, well, preacher, how am I doing? Don't ask. Well, why? Because you ain't going to want to know. And I'm going to be the ugly person in your life, and you ain't going to like me no more. And you, I guess come on in my office. Let's hash it out since you asked. If you ask me and you're serious, come on in. I'll tell you, we're not going to beat around the bush. My God. And the hardest thing is 
jockeying against something that, you know, it, it don't want to get off that horse. It don't want to submit or it don't want to, you know, you, can, am I, come on, friend. You ever felt something like this before and you're, you're bucking against something, but you just can't get past it? Oh, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you know that wife you're dealing with. You know that husband you're dealing with. Oh, you got such a pretty face today. You dress so perfect, and you got your hair parted just right, and, you know, you got your poop just the way it's supposed to be. (laughs) My wife looked at me the other day and said, honey, you're losing your poof. I said, honey, I'm going to hang on to it while I can. It gets thinner. It's just the way it goes. But, you know, if somebody comes up and touches your poof and you've got a problem, that ought to show you you got a problem. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? Amen. Amen. It ought to show you got a problem. Praise the Lord. And uh, I'll, I'll share it once again. But we had a friend back in California, and I'm not going to mention the name, but a uh, you know, he was a Pepsi lover. You know, I don't know how he'd make heaven with Pepsi, though, but whatever. But uh, came up one day, and somebody got ready to touch the top of his hair. And he goes, whoa, man, you leave it alone. You know, that's how some people are when it comes to their will. Leave me alone, preacher. I'm living for God. I'm fine. Boy, I got some of you looking. Amen. I just well be frank. I ain't gonna play games with you, brother Barkley. Well, you most of you weren't here, but he warned you and said, "Hey, look, this preacher ain't gonna be any different." He got that right. But you know, it, it's just uh, you know, can I preach about you? And God bless him. He's doing better. This ain't to hurt you, to offend you, but it's to help me to get something across. You see, for years, and at times, Brother West has got Sunday morningitis. <laughs> Say that again. I can work with that. I can work with that. And um, you know how many times, I mean... And then he'd send me a text, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be in church on Sunday night and not show Sunday night at times. Now, I, I know Wes, and I know he wants to do right, and, and there's a difference between Wes and some other people. I'm not saying Wes is perfect. It's quiet in here. And... Um, but, you know, the example is like this. You can preach and teach all you want, and people are going to do what they want. And what tells the level of his submission, unless he's deadly sick, he got in a car accident, it's going to show, and you look the next Sunday morning to see if he's here, okay? That's setting you up. But, you know, I, I, let me preach. I can talk about being late till I'm blue in the face, being late to church. Well, Brother Mascroft, it's my job. Well, your job sometimes is going to take you to hell. You know? What do you mean, preacher? Can I say this? I can understand sometimes you're going to be late. But I don't understand when you're late all the time and it becomes a habit. Prayer is something that you rarely see in some people's lives because their will. And through that will and what they are doing, it's showing their level of their submission to God. You can justify it. You can try to qualify what you're doing. But I'm asking you another question. What's more important to you? Your will is saying what's more important, whether it's your job or whether God is more important. Amen. Just teaching today. Just teaching. 
You know, um, this is Brother Masscroft, and um, why am I dealing with this? Because I've been having to have to deal with some things. And if I ever send you a text because you won't answer my phone and tell you I have concerns about you, I really do have concerns about you. Okay? And if I ask and say I want to get in a meeting with you and you avoid me, I know there's a problem. Okay? Amen. Can I say this? A pastor, all he can do is preach and teach. He can pray for them. He'll love them the best he can, but he can't be friends with them. Because when you become friends, friend, I'll tell you this, you become so common. And when you become common, they think they can pull and do just what. I told you I was going to take a few strikes today, okay? Amen. Well, why does this happen, pastor? It's the self-will of that individual. I said it's a self-will. I'm not getting a lot of shouting today, man. Maybe, I'm, maybe I'll just reverse this preaching, okay? I think I've already killed it, but that's good. You know? Amen. You know, it amazes me. We can go to a conference, and they'll preach this, and we're shouting all over the place. But I'll tell you what, you let me as a pastor step behind that platform. And when it comes to our church, I'll bet you there's not going to be some people preaching. I mean, that's going to be running shouting. Because I'm going to look them in the face. Say, look, you hypocrite, you. Does anybody understand anything today? Well, pastor, I thought you loved us. Loving you and being honest with you is two different things. Okay? And uh, I will say this. There's been those that, and there's a lot I can say on this subject. But, you know, Jonah had something about himself, about his, his will and level understand of submission to God. Now, understand, Jonah, got, Jonah had to get into alignment somewhere along the way, friend. Or God can make your life so miserable. Did you hear what I said? Wouldn't it be a whole lot better to be like Abraham, friend? And to offer the sacrifice of Isaac, friend, in compliance with what God has asked. Well, God, you're asking too much. No, he ain't. You're demanding too much. Not that he can't do it. But why should God do something when you, number one, don't believe he'll do it? Amen. Good preaching, preacher. When it came to Naaman, friend, and it came to the Jordan River, I must say to you today, he had to struggle with his self-will. Because he didn't want to go down in those dirty waters, friend, that he was going to go down in. Come on. He didn't want to get into Jordan and somewhere have to get down where those snakes and everything else was. And what makes a difference, friend, is when our will will submit to the will of God. When our will will become God's will, friend. And and understand, we understand that God's will is in our life. Let me ask you this. How do you think Peter felt when the Lord came up to him and said, hey, Peter, Why don't you take your nets and throw them on the other side? He's out there. The sun's hot. It's blistering. Been fishing all day long. Got the nets on one side of the boat. And and the Lord comes up and says, Peter, throw your nets on the other side. You know, Lord, I've been fishing for some years. Who do you think you are? You know, sometimes God says things to try our spirit. Did you hear what I said? Sometimes God wants to know, are you going to be obedient and do what I've asked you to do, or what are you going to do? Mm. How many times, have, like today, have you thought, preacher, you're crazy? And the preacher says, throw it, throw your nets on the other side of the boat. Get off your kick, Pastor. Peter's about ready to lose it. He's already baking his bacon out in the sun. Take the nets and throw them over on the other side. I don't know who he thinks he is. And he takes the nets, he throws them on the other side, and the boat begins to start to sink because the catch is so great. 
You see, we don't understand why God, how he works and why he does what he does. We think, man, I've got it all figured out and God understands. I know what God's going to do. You don't know because you're not obedient and because you don't listen to what is being preached. Come on, I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm just being honest with you. I want to make heaven, but I wanna, I'm going to have to make it the right way. Because, friend, i got to get in the right door. Amen. How could Christ ask you to do something if he first didn't face it? When Christ himself was asked to face Calvary and to die for your sins, not his sins. Could you do the same for somebody else? Could you do the same for Jesus Christ? You see, when it comes down to it, by your actions and your will, a lot of things are revealed by your personal ambitions that are contrary to the purposes of God. If you're getting upset today, I want you to understand that what's being revealed is your own personal ambitions. And they're somewhat contrary to what's being taught or the purpose of God. Well, pastor, I don't know the purpose of being here on a Thursday night for your salvation. I said for your salvation. Did you hear what I said? Oh. Well, preacher, I I think going to church on a Thursday night in extra service a week, I think it's a lot too much. That's the problem. It's contrary to your ambitions. You know what happens in that time that you don't show? And well, I, I don't. I don't need to go to church on a Thursday night. Oh, I didn't know you were like the Catholic Church. You're above the word. And the Bible says, forsake not the assembly of yourselves in the manner which some is. Well, if you've got a job situation, we'll talk about it and work with it. Let me ask you a question. When you could be here and be here on time, I said when you could. You know what happens? It, It reveals your selfishness. And the preacher is trying to get you to break out of your self-will. I don't like this kind of preaching. You're being honest with you. Some people ain't going to like it, but it'll get you to heaven. It'll get you through the doors, friend. Well, you know, uh, the Bible talks about the wounds of a friend. You want somebody that's going to yield to what you want all the time? I'm sorry, friend. You're not going to buy this preacher. You're not going to pay him. Amen. I said, you're not going to pay him because it ain't going to work, okay? And, uh, you know, I'll say this. I've had probably one of the roughest years in my life being, being here at the Apostolic Bible Church. You know, I'll say this. When your wife looks at you and gives you an ultimatum, says, John, you better start getting some money because elsewise you better start drawing your Social Security because I can't keep on affording you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'll tell you, I'll put God first, but I'll say this. I think some of us need to learn some things. Mm, I'm getting quiet in here, ain't it? What do you mean, preacher? You know what? We're putting God first in everything. We know there's going to be rough times, but I'm going to say this. A self-willed person is a thief at times. Well, preacher, I don't see the need of paying offerings and tithes. Well, number one, you're out of alignment with the Word of God. Well, that was, during, that was instituted during the time of Moses. That's a bunch of hogwash. You haven't read your Bible. Maybe you need to go back to the book of Genesis where the Lord instituted in the garden when it came to the, to the tree. You just leave this one tree alone. It's mine. And the Lord tells us when it comes in different passages in Scripture, and it says, friend, that uh, bring the tithes in, into the house. Can I say this? The first 10% is God's anyway. It's not mine. And when I take the attitude that I'm giving my 10%, it's not yours, number one. It's God's. Can I say this? And let's just, let's just level it. Let's just level it, okay? 
Well, you know, in Malachi, it made the statement, when you pay tithes, you pay tithes and offerings. Well, Brother Mascroft, how much is offerings? Let me say this right now, okay? It's anything past the 10%. You know, God said, hey, look, I'm going to get, there's 100%. You do what you're going to do with it. But the 10% is mine. So number one, and I'll just be straight with you, if you don't pay the 10%, you're a thief. Amen. And if you may come across and you may say, well, I can't afford to pay my 10%. And I'm coming back to you and I'm telling you, you can't afford not to pay your 10%. Because, friend, tithes and offerings, well, understand, if you don't do it, it ain't going to get you into heaven. It's going to put you outside of heaven. Because there ain't going to be any thieves that's going to be in heaven. Well, well, Pastor, well, let's talk, talk more about this offering deal. And I'm not teaching on it, but since you've asked, okay. Uh, come on, God gave you 90% to do what you want to do with it. You know, and as a church, I'll tell you what, to make things work around here, we give 5% of offerings. And I would encourage as many as possible that can give 5%, friend. Because, uh, well, let's back up a moment. Well, the 10% goes to pay for the building that's not supposed to. It's supposed to go to the ministry. Do you hear what I said? Read your Bible again. I'm not trying to be arrogant or offensive, but read your Bible. When it comes to the 10%, it's given to the ministry to carry on the work of God. The Bible says that when it comes to ox, don't muzzle the ox. In other words, friend, it, it, it takes money to live. What do the offerings go for? To pay for the gas, to pay for the electric, to pay for the building, to pay for this and that. But I'll say this, we still, I still take some, a lot of the tides out of it to do it. My point is this, we all do what we need to do and quit being Scrooges. My God. I said quit being Scrooges. You know, well, man, I, I think 15% is too much to pay. Well, then why don't you go to look at somebody paying 20, 25% in this church? And I'll say this, they're not getting cheated. They're getting blessed. God's taking care of them. God's giving them what they need, friend. Hey, I think sometimes, you know, the thing that's going to define the heart of an individual is I dare to say that probably 80% of you today got more money than what I got in my wallet. Most of the time, I don't got a dollar in my wallet. I probably got three or four or five bucks. My wife got the other eight the other day. Amen. What are you saying? It's getting quiet. Woo! Well, man, I'll, I'll put a hundred bucks in the offering. I'll put—I mean, I'll put a hundred bucks in tithes, and I'll put fifty cents in the offering. I hope God don't hold that against you. Ooh, it's quiet. I think we better stand for if I get somebody upset. Amen. You don't get numbers by preaching this, I'll tell you. I need, I need to teach on tithes and offerings. I need at least four lessons, friend. I mean, four different nights to bring it across and to bring it across clear. But, um, you know, thank God for good people. A preacher, you're, you're in this thing for money. Friend, I want to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. I have given and given and given and given. I looked at somebody just um, within the last week, and I said, I can't afford to go nowhere right now. I might be able to take a night, take a day, but I can't afford to go nowhere. And I'm not asking for no pity. But I'll say this. I believe God's going to, when God opens up the records, there's going to be a lot of things that's going to be revealed. One thing, and give me just a few moments, but one thing I learned when I was back home and mama beat it into me. And that little short 83-year-old woman. She said, boy, you're going to pay your tithes. Mama, this is my money. Friend, I wanted to get a McDonald's job when I was young, and they wouldn't hire me. McDonald's back then was so hard to get a job. Just about anybody can get a job at McDonald's now. But I'll tell you what, getting out there, and it didn't matter if I was working 25 cents an hour, and I'm not exaggerating, pulling weeds. 
40 hours, get 10 bucks at 25 cents an hour. Moved up at the fruit stand and finally got about a buck 25, a buck 50 an hour. Big money, man. Take 10% off of that. Man, that's a lot of money. No, it's where your heart's at. Well, God, give me a job that's going to pay me 100, 200,000 a year. Why should he? You're dishonest. You're a thief. If you can't take care of God in the little things, you're not going to take care of God in the big things. And if you haven't learned some principles yet, it's about time you learn some if you're going to submit your will to God's authority. I'm not talking about me, friend. I'm talking about God himself. And I'm being a little bit today about like Brother Barkley, I guess. Can I be blunt with you? Does anybody love to eat? Don't raise your hands because some of you ain't going to do it if I ask you to do it anyway. There's the table. There's the table. There's the Big Macs. There's Burger King. There's Wendy's. Taco Bell. My wife looked at me the other day and said, John, I think Taco Bell is better than any Mexican restaurant we got around. And they are pretty good. But you know what? I can put it all on the table. You know, as a young pastor, I couldn't figure out what's wrong with these people. They sit back like, yourself thank you sister Mina oh some of you put a smile on your face what you will do for a picture wouldn't you Some people are so focused on themselves. Get me. You know, people are such hams. I'll tell you what, I'm not going to put pictures of me on some places. But you can sure tell about people that love selfies. sick my god where did we leave off brother Wes you just happy I got off your kick amen still love you man still love you honey where did I leave off Taco Bell and what happens is that you put it on the table. And Brother Barkley got me lined out one day. Yeah, Brother Mascroft. I know what the problem is. Brother Barkley, what you holding back to him? He goes, they're just not eating. Whew. You know, it, 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 it's like, I'm glad you brought it up. But I can be up here preaching and I can make an altar call and it's like, Hang on to that row. You know, I I got no sin in my life. You know, I'm doing pretty good living for God. Why don't you come ask me? I don't understand sometimes when we have altar calls. People are so focused on their own situation. They can't even go down and pray for some poor lost individual.
I'll just stay on the, pro, pro, the, the praise team and I don't have to go pray with anybody. What's glad? We're not jumping and shouting today. Maybe we need to get an evangelist in here, get Brother Latif here. I'll tell you what, you let him preach what I preach, you probably wouldn't like it. He's not pastoring. And I'll tell you something, I believe he wishes he was pastoring. Because you get on boot camp on the evangelistic field. I know he'd rather be pastoring right now. What do you mean, preacher? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm taking my time. I don't get to do this too often. Not that I love it. I, I, I pray, but you know, sometimes things are needed. It's your pastor, and I'm going to bring you back to where I started. Pastor, what is the hardest thing in your ministry that you ever had to deal with? And I must be honest with you today, it is the self-will of an individual. People who think they're something and lost a spirit of humility. People who think they own everything in a church and think they're something. It's quiet. Church, what happened to the humility? What happened to the humbleness? What happened with your, so, your, your self-will revealing your level of submission to God? Can we just bow our heads right where we're at and talk with the Lord right where you're at? Talk to us, Holy Ghost. Talk to us, Lord. We're going to leave here before too long. God, what a shame to have to leave today and not take it to heart.